I'd be the first to admit that we went down this road really at the beginning for the pure joy of taking on a challenge that was largely thought to be impossible. There was no textbook on how to go and do this. I'm Richard Browning, I am founder and chief test pilot from Gravity and we build 1,000 horsepower jet engine flying suits. For the last few years, Browning and his team have tested every possible design and configuration they could come up with, all in an effort to make this a reality. The origins of the concept were all around some of the inspiration from my early life. I used to fly model gliders and model aircraft with my father. He was an aeronautical engineer, his father was a pilot, so I guess it was in the blood. But fulfilling his dream of flying required real physical demands too. I spent some time in the Royal Marines Reserve and the time in the military and all the sports I pursued after that taught me a lot about the capability of the human mind and body. I'm no great athlete, but I did learn a lot about how if you focus the human form on a challenge, whether you want to be an ice skater or a gymnast or whatever, it is amazing how this machine can be adapted. I got to the point with this calisthenics body weight training where I could support my own weight in a number of different kind of unusual positions, like flags for instance. And I thought, well, if you just replace that hard structure that I'm holding onto with actually a form of thrust, I can hold my body in any number of different kind of flight positions. So as, as ludicrous as that sounded, I thought, well, let's just go and experiment with it. First, he needed to figure out how to stay suspended in the air. The form of thrust I landed on was gas turbines. Gas turbines are notorious for being very small form factors, extremely aggressive. And one gas turbine weighs five pounds and puts out about 50 pounds of thrust. So, in 2016, Browning started testing different components and variations. And so having experimented with one, we went to two, and then went to four, and it was getting increasingly compelling. But things didn't always go quite so smoothly. Through lots and lots of trial and error, and constantly failing, to be honest, and learning all the time from those safe fails, we got to a point where we managed to achieve a flight, and that was two engines on each arm and an engine on each leg. But there were basic problems at every stage, starting with the decision to have engines on each leg. There's a number of interesting challenges with that model. The problems included the engines being only three or four inches off the ground in terms of the exhaust thrust, the violence of air coming out of those engines at about a thousand miles an hour and hitting even concrete. You could see a smooth concrete surface would start to become pitted from the sheer violence of that air. And yet, as you move them away, the, the violence of the velocity drops off. There was also a challenge with having the engines on the legs in that if you happen to vector your arm engines anywhere near the intakes of the lower engine, we realized that your in inducted air is going in and that would then spike the exhaust temperature. You could see a little puff of sparks and the engine would just shut down. So that was another good reason for not having the engines down there. And finally, there's a strange human behavior we learned, which is that when your feet feel the ground has, has left them, they, they almost want to pedal and scrabble around looking for where that surface is. That's not helpful when you've got 50 pounds of thrust coming off each leg. And those problems led to the solution of actually moving those engines slowly up the body and then consolidating them into one. And essentially that created a skirt all at the same altitude in the body, which can be likened to the three legs of a tripod. There's thrust coming out of each arm and then essentially a third leg coming out of the back of your body, which provides that uncanny stability. And that's how we learned to fly. I can step you through what the components are. So you've essentially got an arm mount. Your arm goes inside that aluminum 3D printed tube. You've got a micro gas turbine on each side and you've got the same on the other side, obviously. And round the back and there's one more engine, which is roughly the power of these two together. Uh, on the front here, you've got a lot of the electronic control systems and the batteries which aren't plugged in here. Those batteries actually run the starter motors and the glow plugs. And then on the sides, you've got a, a couple of fuel bladders. We've also got a helmet. It's an especially lightweight one. And the extra addition to it is a heads up display system. So inside there, you can see the, the lenses which actually paint over my vision, the fuel and engine data. That data gets to the uh, lenses via this little device. That takes a wireless feed from the suit. It shows me everything to do with the engines and everything to, do, everything to do with the fuel to give me an idea as to how close we are to running out of fuel, for instance. Last year, Browning set the world speed record for a body-controlled jet suit, clocking in at 32 miles per hour. He says the suit can actually fly much faster and higher than they've ever attempted. But for now, they're playing it safe. That's because even at lower speeds and altitudes, there are still risks. The fuel is either diesel or jet fuel. They're fundamentally the same fuels. Jet fuel sounds scary, but it's the same kind of stuff as di diesel. It's actually not prone to forming vapor clouds. It's not really explosive. In fact, you're really hard pushed to even ignite it. And even if it did burn in an uncontrolled way, you've certainly got probably 10, 15 seconds before it becomes a big fire. Every single time we fly, we have fire extinguishers around the place. In two years of doing this, we've never used a fire extinguisher. So I I'm not worried, but I have respect for the fire aspect of this. The heat aspect of it, it's funny, but if you get a hair dryer and you press it against your head, you're going to burn your head. Hold it like two feet away and it's cold. The specific heat capacity of air is so poor that actually the heat dissipates really quickly. 
And I've even swiped those engines across my leg with, with this, you know, heavy cotton flight trousers on. All it did is just slightly singe the very top surface of the fabric. It didn't do anything. So from a heat and fire point of view, it's really not a significant concern, we, but we manage it. He's more concerned with falls and collisions. It's akin to riding a sports motorbike. If you, if you gun that 80, 100 miles an hour around small twisty roads and come off that, it's gonna hurt. If I'm 10 feet above the ground and got an engine failure, I simply go downwards. There is no scenario where our system can suddenly, in an uncontrolled way, gain height or shoot off to one side. You simply drop, uh, which is not a good thing. But we've always got to allow for the potential for, for an extremely unlikely mechanical failure of one of the engines, and then in which case you do, you do fall. That's why we keep the height fairly limited. Speed-wise, we can easily do 35 miles an hour, so we've gone quite a bit quicker in testing, but again, for most of what we do, by the time you've done 35 miles an hour, you've gone a long way away from probably the audience or the area you're flying, so by then you're coming back again. We push the limits a little bit more over water because that's a bit more forgiving if you, if you fell in it. So Browning's jet suit is no longer just a pipe dream, but what exactly is it for? They recently started custom designing and selling them, but at a price tag of about $440,000 a suit, it's safe to say it'll be out of reach for most. But that could change. As we improve the efficiency and the ease of use, then there is the potential for, I don't want to say mass transit straight away, but, but we have developed something that allows you to move human beings around in a, in a completely unprecedented way. One of the biggest challenges for bringing down cost? Designing suits that are more fuel efficient. This model currently burns about a gallon of fuel a minute. That's one of the reasons they're working on an electric version and a set of wings that, when deployed mid-flight, would generate lift more efficiently. They're also hoping some competition might spur innovation. Throughout history, when, when two human beings have said, I think mine's faster than yours, that does push the envelope. So next year, 2019, we are building out a race series for this. Yes, a racing series. Think Formula One, but with jet suits. We've already had several pilots flying. The record so far is five minutes, five minutes of air time. So we can have a bunch of young guys and girls going actually racing 1,000 horsepower jet suits over water to keep it safe, but doing something that only people have seen before really in a Marvel film. And that is going to push the boundaries like nothing before. I think for the immediate future, it'll be entertainment, it'll be inspiring people, and it'll be really fueling the journey onto creating a revolution in human transport.